So before we start, some uh, gentle reminder for all our participants. Welcome to all. Uh, you can see some of the instructions in the chat. Uh, kindly Yeah, so kindly rename yourself so we can uh, acknowledge you uh, later. And then uh, for all the participants, please keep your uh, microphone on mute. We will have an open uh, forum later for your questions and uh, inputs that will come after all our speakers. Uh, you can turn on your video so we can see each other, although we are far from each other all around the world. And for our uh, those who need interpretation, we have a Spanish interpretation. Please kind of ac uh, access it at the interpretation button uh, below your screen. There's a globe there. You can uh, click it and choose uh, English or Spanish uh, if you will need uh, Spanish interpretation. We are also live on. Uh, some of the Facebook pages of our partners and co-sponsors. So please uh, like and share it and invite your friends, your families, your uh, networks and office mates to, to join us this morning. So we'll start in a few seconds, anytime now. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Welcome to the official, one of the official side events of the UN Water Conference 2023. So this is Committing to the Flow of People-Centered Water Action, the official virtual side event of the UN Water Conference 2023. And this uh, event, side event, is sponsored and brought to you by Ebon International, the International Indigenous People's Movement for Self-Determination and Liberation, IPMSL, Center for Environment Concerns of the Philippines, CEC Philippines, Center for Research and Advocacy Manipur, CRI Manipur, Ogoni Solidarity Forum, Consejo Indigena Maya Chiorti de Olopa Chikimala, Katribu National Alliance of Indigenous Peoples in the Philippines, Asia Indigenous Peoples Network on Extractive Industries and Energy, or the Liara Peoples Alliance, and TSO Partnership for Development Effectiveness, IP Constituency. We have a lot of our sponsors. We're very glad that also a lot of uh, participants are here. We're very happy and glad to share to you this virtual side event. I am Paul Belisario, the Assistant Global Coordinator of IPMSDL, here to host and moderate today's discussion. So what is this all about? So uh, this side event is all about uh, contributing uh, to the UN Water Conference 2023 by gathering indigenous peoples, environment defenders, different civil society organizations to hear their experiences and challenges and how we can harness their knowledge and actions to achieve a truly sustainable management of water resources. And uh, this side event is very important to us, very special to us because just uh, last March 14, we celebrated 
the International Day of Action for Rivers, a very, very important body of water that contributes a lot to our water resources. So we would like to make this discussion to center on these bodies of water, on the people's rights, on how we can all participate and what we can commit, what we can promise to make the use and management of our water to benefit our communities, our people. So uh, I won't uh, take anything uh, long enough. This is an exciting discussion. We have speakers from all over the world. We have our friends from the Pacific, all the way from Vanuatu. We have our friends from here in Asia, from India and Philippines. Of course, we are waiting for some of our friends, our speakers from Nigeria. And uh, we have uh, some of key messages from Guatemala and also our friends and colleagues from the plurinational uh, Bolivia. So. Let's open up uh, our discussion by a video, a welcoming video from our friends all the way from Olopa, Chiquimala in Guatemala. Let's hear from Norma Sancir, a community journalist, a social communicator, and a human rights defender of the Maya Chiorti people in Chiquimala, Guatemala. The Maya Chiorti people in Chiquimala faces challenges in protecting their rivers, their waters, and indigenous lands from different projects like palm oil and mining, which results to pollution, uh, human rights violations of their waters and of their land. So to welcome us all, let's all uh, hear from Norma. Bienvenidos y bienvenidas todos los que se encuentran ya presentes en esta sala, en este evento paralelo virtual oficial, en el marco de la conferencia de las Naciones Unidas eh, sobre el agua 2023. Eh, estamos hoy aquí reunidos representantes de organizaciones, de pueblos, de países, que nos hemos eh, encontrado en este espacio para poder compartir nuestras experiencias, nuestros saberes y todo ese conocimiento que se ha acumulado a través de estos años y que se ha mantenido desde el conocimiento de los pueblos indígenas. Hoy me encuentro en este espacio para darle la bienvenida en representación del Consejo Indígena Maya Chortí de Olopa Chiquimula, Guatemala. Nos encontramos en este espacio en representación de 14 comunidades que están haciendo resistencia contra proyectos extractivos y contra todo proyecto que quiera destruir sus cerros, sus montañas, sus ríos, sus nacimientos, sus aguas. El Consejo Indígena en este momento, en esta semana, en el marco del Día Internacional del Agua, está llevando a cabo diferentes acciones de posicionamiento político, de resistencia, pero también de diálogo. En estos momentos se está llevando a cabo una audiencia donde se va a presentar las pruebas en contra de personas criminalizadas por defender el derecho humano al agua. Sabemos bien que las personas que están haciendo la defensa de estos derechos están siendo criminalizados por los estados y hoy se está llevando también esta audiencia donde han asistido representantes de la población maya chortí. Paralelamente, eh, Ubaldino García Canán se encuentra en la conferencia de las Naciones Unidas sobre el Agua en Nueva York, donde él también va a presentar estas problemáticas, va a compartir con otros pueblos y por supuesto van a llegar a acuerdos. Asimismo, también hay una representación, una delegación en el evento oficial en Guatemala, en el Santiago Atitlán, donde se encuentra el llamado lago más bello del mundo, se encuentra representación de hombres y mujeres mayas chortí, que estarán presentes en la asamblea este plurinacional del agua es un espacio donde pueblos de guatemala se están convocando y están coincidiendo para hablar sobre esta problemática cómo el estado está actuando en contra de los y las defensores que están protegiendo sus ríos sus aguas pero también qué están haciendo las comunidades para sostener esta defensa de derechos qué están haciendo las comunidades para resguardar el conocimiento ancestral, pero a través de este conocimiento ancestral también, ¿qué están haciendo para proteger los ríos eh, de estas empresas extractivas que están destruyendo los pocos, eh, eh, los pocos 
cerros y montañas de donde se guarda el agua. Entonces es así como les damos la bienvenida a este evento. Esperamos que de este espacio podamos concluir con acciones y conclusiones que podamos hacer en conjunto. No estamos solos. El pueblo chortino está haciendo solo resistencia. Son pueblos del mundo, en el África, en Asia, en Oceanía, donde estamos juntos y juntas haciendo estas acciones y por eso nos encontramos en este evento. Muchas gracias y bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Definitely, we are not alone and we are happy to be here with you wherever you are in the world. And we're here to talk about how we can build solidarity together. We are here on how to act together in really obtaining a people-centered water action. So thank you so much, Norma. So let's uh, move on with our program uh, on our uh, there's a lot of topics that we'd like to cover and to touch, especially on uh, some very great sharing from our speakers. So our first uh, panelist, our speaker for today, uh, he is an indigenous leader from Manipur, Northeast India. He's a journalist, he's a researcher, rights and environment defenders, and has written a lot of materials on investments and impacts of large dams, oil explorations, on forest land grabbing, and many more. He's actually the Secretary General of the Center for Research and Advocacy in Manipur in Northeast India, and uh, one of our beloved Internal Coordinating Council of IPMSGS. Let's all welcome Mr. Jiten Yumna. Hello, Jiten. Hi. Uh... Okay, so Jiten, the floor is yours to share about indigenous peoples and the rivers and the challenges of that. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Oh yes. Uh, oh yes, I'm. I'm. Uh, yes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, hi, good morning, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jitin Yumnam, and I work with the Center for Research and Advocacy in Manipur. Uh, and today, I'll be sharing on the issue of uh, dam building in northeast part of India and the Mekong region, uh, and also looking into some of the challenges uh, and issues of dam building in, in this region. Uh, I would like to begin that uh, dam building has been aggressively pursued um, in the northeast of India and also in the Great Mekong region. Uh, and for many of the indigenous peoples in this uh, region, uh, rivers, uh, land, and uh, forests are life, um, sustaining the life and culture of many of the uh, indigenous communities uh, in this region. Uh, but the government and the dam building companies uh, are perceiving this, uh, our river as a source of profit and source of power generation. Uh, and this has led to a multiple impact um, on our people's way of life. Uh, and in our case, uh, the multiple rivers in our land, we have the Brahmaputra River, the Barak River, the Star River, and several other rivers are classified uh, as, uh, uh, as source of power. And in fact, our region has been classified as a powerhouse of India. Um, when our region hardly requires 2,000 megawatt, um, but there is push for more than uh, 60,000 uh, megawatt of uh, energy in our region. And often these are pursued without uh, taking the consent of our people. And similarly in uh, the Mekong region, uh, places like the Laos, uh, Laos is one of the country uh, where the Mekong River flow, it's been classified as the battery of Southeast Asia. Uh, but this region are very uh, prone to high seismic, uh, seismic activity and classified as very high uh, seismic zone. And also these are also very rich in biodiversity. And in fact, uh, the Northeast part of India is uh, composed of two biodiversity hotspots, uh, the Eastern Himalaya and the Indo-Burma biodiversity uh, spot. So it's been, it explains the diversity of flora, the flowers and, um, and other animal species in the region. Um, I would also like to point out that uh, the building of large dam, uh, it also involves not just construction of uh, dam over our rivers, but also it involves construction of mega infrastructure projects uh, like roads, high voltage transmission and distribution lines uh, and other infrastructures. Uh, and, uh, and some of the dams pursued in our region includes very uh, me mega colossal dams uh, that includes, uh, you know, like the 2,880 megawatt debound dam, 
and other uh, large dam. Um, yeah, so this is the Mekong River. Uh, this is flowing through Laos. Um, and in fact, there are multiple large dams which are pursued um, in, in countries like Laos, in Thailand, in Cambodia, uh, and also in upper parts of, um, uh, in the stretch of the Mekong River in China. Uh, and if you see this map, you can see that there are multiple dams uh, proposed. Um, so if you just see the dams, um, like in there are series of dams already built in China, and there are also multiple dams uh, currently built in in Laos. You know? so you can see that the Sayaburi Dam, and then you have the Pakmun Dam, and then uh, in Cambodia you have the Three S Dam, the dams over the Sekong, Sepok, and Sekong River. And these are all threatening the um, uh, threatening the lives of indigenous peoples in um, in these areas. No, yeah. So you could see the multiple dams which are pursued in Laos, in Myanmar, in Thailand, in Cambodia. Uh, the Sayaburi Dam is one of the biggest dam uh, proposed. Uh, it's an ongoing construction dam. The three S dams. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the dam in Laos, it, uh, it is already, um, it collapsed in 2018. It uh, it breaks, it collapsed, and it killed so many people, and it flooded um, in, in an extensive portion of um, of land in, uh, not just in Laos, you know, but in uh, several parts of, um, in downstream areas in, in Thailand as well. Um, yeah, so this is a controversial Sayaburi Dam in uh, in Laos, and this is um, it caused so much of uh, impact not just to the indigenous peoples but also in the downstream communities in in Thailand and also in Cambodia uh, further down uh, the Mekong River. So this is uh, the 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 this is what happened during the 2018 dam collapse of the Si Pian Sienam Noi Hydroelectric Power Project. This is in Laos. Uh, yeah, so I would uh, highlight that dam building also involves a massive destruction of forests and agricultural land, and also destruction of the cultural and sacred sites. Uh, this is the uh, 1,200 megawatt uh, Tista tree hydro project in Sikkim. Sikkim is one of the small state in northeast part of India, but uh, the massive construction of uh, large dam it already entailed massive destruction to the biodiversity and the culture of the Lepsa people uh, in Sikkim. Uh, and similarly, uh, this is a dam called Mapit Dam in Manipur, uh, another one of the state where many multiple dams are pursued and uh, it caused so much of uh, loss of livelihood and displacement of indigenous peoples in Manipur, but also in many other states across uh, the northeast part of India. Uh, one of the impact of uh, last dam is uh, the issue of flood and disaster. Uh, many of the dam uh, in in northeast part of India, the Ranganadi, the uh, the Pare project, um, the Doyang Dam, and many other dams, it it caused massive release of water, especially during the flood uh, during the monsoon period, and it causing massive uh, uh, massive flood in the downstream areas, especially in Assam State. You know? So this is one of the flood that caused in two thousand twenty two last year. And uh, similarly, one of the major concern of the large dam. Um, series of dam built in the Mekong region is also the issue of flooding in the downstream areas um, and the diversion of water. Uh, and I think in Vietnam has a lot of concern with the dam building in the upper straits of Mekong River. Um, uh, yeah, it will affect uh, the livelihood in the Mekong Delta region in Vietnam. Uh, so that's also one of the concern of large dam. Uh, dam building, uh, it also involves massive boring of tunnels and uh, infrastructure like road building. So it caused massive landslide, uh, especially in earthquake uh, zone areas. No? So this is another case of massive landslide happening in Sikkim uh, due to the construction of uh, large dams. Uh, so in general, if you look at the multiple impact of uh, dam, it involves uh, loss of endemic species. It involves the non-recognition of indigenous people's rights. It involves the violation of the cultural rights of uh, the indigenous peoples. And um, and also there are, dam building also involves uh, the lack of corporate accountability. Uh, uh, and then issues of corruption, manipulation, the downstream impact, dams also lead to multiple uh, disaster and issues of workers' rights violation. And dam is also associated with militarization and uh, severe case of human rights uh, violation. Uh, so these are some of the impacts that we see across uh, the northeast part of India. Um, and interestingly, dams are again projected as a uh, solution to climate change. No? 
but uh, dam building itself it led to submergence of massive agriculture and forest land. So which means there is um, emission of greenhouse gas uh, due to the uh, submergence of forest and agriculture land. Uh, and in fact, uh, dam building has been um, confirmed to contribute to global climate change. But um, in India and many other places in South Asia and even in the Mekong region, uh, large dam are being pursued as a solution to climate change. So which means um, there is a false, uh, uh, false push for solution to climate change. No? Um, and I think this is a big concern. Uh, and for, for example, large hydro projects are classified as renewable, green, uh, and clean source of energy in 2019. Um, but all of this is uh, to ensure that the many of the countries are able to um, uh, claiming to fulfill the intended nationally determined contribution uh, uh, under UNFCC. Um, uh, under UN UNFCC. Mm. Uh, dams are major emitter of greenhouse gas. Uh, yeah, so but another another reality of concern is the ADB, the international financial institutions are increasingly financing large land. No? Uh, and I think this is a major concern. The Asian Development Bank, the World Bank are increasingly financing, um, uh, like in Northeast, uh, the lower Kopili Dam is financed by the Asian Development Bank. World Bank is financing the Sindha Dam innovation in Manipur. Sindha Dam is very controversial out here. And then the World Bank is also financing the can see it through the media is no financing indirectly through multiple banks and uh, private uh, finance um world bank is also funding the 400 megawatt high voltage transmission distribution line so these are infrastructures no road building and um uh, voltage transmission line that facilitate the construction of dams uh, across the region i think this is a similar reality in the uh, mekong region where the adb is also asian development bank is directly involved in financing uh, many of the uh, in France, it's a project, no high voltage transmission line uh, that supports the construction of large dam. Um, to see is the part of the private sector, which means the multi multinational companies are actually benefiting from dam building. So you know there are a lot of public private partnership projects pursued, uh, and then in in at least in Northeast, we see that so many dam com building companies are uh, benefiting from dam building, no? and the construction companies are there. You have the consultant company private suppliers, the private banks, private equity fund, and then the CDM verifying agency. Uh, there are so many private sector, uh, uh, you know, dam building companies that are actually involved in benefiting from them. Uh, even as many of these dams are involved in serious uh, human rights violation uh, uh, and in destruction of our environment uh, and, and contributing to climate crisis. No? So I think uh, this is one of the biggest concerns, uh, how the private sector, private multinational companies are benefiting from them, even as the people and the environment suffer. Uh, yeah, so there are increased resistance uh, and expression of concern no? in the Mekong region. I think uh, there are so many uh, concerns, no? uh, campaign against the Sayaburi Dam, Campaign against the Papun Dam, campaign against uh, Tree S Dam, uh, which is one of the tributaries, many uh, tributaries of um, Sekong River, uh, Sripok River are the tributaries of Mekong River. No? But then there are series of concern expressed uh, to dam building. Uh, and in, even in Northeast, there are series of concern expressed um, with the uh, uh, dam building. And in fact, there are new dams which are proposed again. No? In Sikkim, uh, the Lipsa people are resisting the proposed construction of the um, 520 megawatt Tista 4 hydroelectric project uh, to defend the land, the traditional land, Jonggu. Um, and while also challenging the uh, the dams that are already built and destroyed the land. Uh, and similarly, in Arunachal Pradesh, uh, one of the states in Northeast where cities of dams are proposed, uh, there are increased resistance to uh, mega dams, you know, just 2,880 uh, megawatt uh, Dibang Dam. And also the Italian dam. This, are, this is more than 3,000 megawatt uh, dam no, in Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, this is again the resistance against um, the Tista 4, STS 4 dam in Sikkim. Yeah, in Manipur, uh, we have multiple uh, campaign and resistance against uh, dam. And one of the main campaign is against the Tipaimuk dam. Tipaimuk dam is 1,500 megawatt dam proposed over the Barak River. So this is one of the major campaign against uh, dam building in in Manipur, um, yeah. So, so if we look at the 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 realities of dam building, I feel that we should we should promote. We call upon the government and also the dam building companies um, and all the stakeholders to 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 respect 
uh, our rights of a river, no? that uh, to acknowledge the fact that rivers are life for communities. And uh, we call upon the states and the government and the corporates to stop perceiving our rivers as a source of profit. Because our rivers are life, it's source of our culture, it's source of our livelihood. And this is not source of um, just power and profit. And it, with this, we call to stop building large time in indigenous territory and other territories without recognizing their rights over the land and territory and without taking the free prior and informed consent. So we, so that's why we call for the recognition of indigenous people's right over our land and resources. Um, and with this, uh, it's important to recognize the people's uh, intrinsic relationship, the survival and cultural relationship with the river, with the forest and land. And uh, especially, we also call uh, to stop projecting large dam as solution to climate change. Um, uh, because uh, we call this because dams, um, it actually contribute to climate change by destroying our land or forest or river. Uh, and we also call upon the international financial institutions like the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank to stop financing large dam because dams are not a uh, clean source of energy. Uh, and that uh, we also call upon the, the corporate bodies, the multinational companies to stop profiting from dam building. Uh, stop profiting from river. River is our life. Uh, let our rivers flow free for all generations and uh, let strengthen the solidarity among indigenous and all the dam affected communities and all the progressive um, organizations to stand against them and to defend our rights of our river and let's um, protect our land, let's protect our future. And with this, I would like to uh, thank you very much for your passion. Listen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeet. And I think uh, those uh, many recommendations and actions are some of the major concerns that only of our indigenous peoples in Northeast India, in Mekong, you know, this business of building dams, pushing it as a solution to our uh, climate uh, problems have been very, very, have received a lot of uh, concerns and really a lot of resistance for our peoples who are uh, depending on the river for their life, for their culture. We have a lot of good questions in the chat and we'll get, uh, get to that later. So for all the participants, please uh, keep your thoughts uh, uh, flowing in our group chat. We're gathering them and later in the open forum, uh, hopefully you have enough time to address all your questions and inputs and suggestions. So let's move on. Thank you so much again uh, to G10. We have our uh, next speaker from the issues of how the indigenous peoples and the rivers and the dams and how do these local communities, indigenous communities look at this and how do they want the water source to be used, to be managed in a way that protects their culture, their identity, and their rights. Let's move on. On some of the projects where uh, water reclamations has also impacted the lives of the people in, and also their livelihood. We have uh, here from the Philippines, Ms. Shirley Masurka from the Unity of Fisher Folks and Citizens of Bulacan in the Philippines, followed uh, immediately by Jose Paulo Asuncion from the Center for Environmental Concerns Philippines to shed light on how these issues uh, can contribute on how we look, how we treat water and how it can really benefit sustainably uh, be used by the people. So Shirley and Paulo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, uh, Jitin, for the very insightful presentation on uh, dams and how uh, it has impacted you know, waters and, of course, people's livelihood and by them. So, for my presentations, it's going to be around uh, to involve water reclamation projects, and of course, how it has been impacting. Uh, livelihood and water. So uh, before we go to um, Shirley's video, um, I will first uh, establish a bit of a context of the specific uh, reclamation project that is, um, that is um, focused on her video, which will come um, after my short presentation. 
just to uh, establish what it is. So in the Philippines, uh, San Miguel Corporation is very well known for its beer, beer, very good beer. And uh, currently, they're known right now for um, environmental groups, Fisher Folk, and of course, from rights group for this big project called the Aeropropolis Project that is uh, located in Bulacan, Bulacan. So the picture that you can see here is that a rendered master plan from their, um, from their uh, architecture partner. So that's how it will look like uh, for them. That's how they envision this project to, to be built. So quite modern and quote unquote beautiful. In modern. So what is the Aerotropolis project of San Miguel Corporation? Well, first, it is a 740 billion peso project spanning 2,500 hectares within the coast of Bulacan. So 740 billion pesos is around 13.6 billion US dollars. So it's it's not an insignificant project. It's probably one of the biggest projects to date in this in the Philippines, and it is aimed to be the largest airport in the Philippines that can accommodate 100 million passengers, and it will have four runways compared to the main airport in um, Manila. So within that 2,500 hectares, 1,693 of it is dedicated for the airport itself. And 807 hectares is dedicated for an aerocity complex that they will build alongside the airport. So that will be where the um, exports, manufacturing, maybe some people will live there near the airport. I don't know yet the very um, detailed plans of that complex, but that's how it is divided. And if you can see here in this picture, it, it, it will affect or it's, it has affected the uh, Barangay Palitik in Bulacan and along with it, it's seven seats. So that's how big it is, you know, for a rough scale. So it's quite big. And it is part of the Build, Build, Build program of the former um, Duterte administration. And, you know, it, it is continued by Ferdinand Marcos Jr. So um, aside from decongesting, uh, Naia or Mino Aquino International Airport in Manila. It aims to also bring world class airport facilities and services. It aims to contribute to the country's economic growth, to tourism, to the air traffic, to investment, increases in exports and construction, and the promise of 1 million jobs. That's what they say that they will give 1 million jobs to, to the people who, are, who will be part of the project. Now, Next, so, okay, so the airport is just actually a part of a wider range of reclamation projects in and, in and around of, of Manila Bay. So currently, there are 22 reclamation projects planned in Manila Bay. There are um, half of that, according to the Philippine Reclamation Authority, is already underway. And those 22 reclamation projects have already secured environmental compliance certificates from our national environmental body, the Department of uh, Environmental and Natural Resources, or DPNR. Now, if you can, now you can focus your eyes here on the three um, companies here, because for this project, some notable proponents or development actors involved in this project is, of course, San Miguel Corporation, which will fund most of the most of its construction and of course its operation when it's fully built. Now, um, it has received strong backing from the Dutch government through outrageous Dutch state business who extended um, the export credit insurance to Boscalis. It, uh, it is a Dutch dredging company. And the and the export credit insurance is valued at 1.5 billion euros for its land development. So Boscalis will be the one who will do all the claiming, who will do the dredging in the, for, the, for the airport. So there. 
And currently, as of December 2022, it's the the land development for the project is almost uh, 50%. So halfway there already. So now they can start uh, constructing the foundations of the airport because half of it, half of the land is now there. Now, now there. And they target 2027 as the year for its for the uh, project's full operation. Now, next is so for those who are not familiar with the term development aggression, it is a uh, it is used by indigenous people to describe projects or activities that violates human rights. So in this case, of course, it is not just a uh, indigenous people, but of course us. It applies to us, civil society organizations, farmers, and future folk. So in the picture that you can see here, it is just a picture of a uh, coastal home in, in uh, Bulacan that is um, affected by the project. Now, why is it development aggression? Well, first, because the, fisher, the fishing community in the Philippines, especially in Bulacan, is one of the uh, poorest and most, and most vulnerable to climate change impacts. Okay, so the project, um, there the area is already vulnerable to flooding, and because of climate change and the worsening typhoons, storms, the more rain that is being um being uh thrown to us here in the Philippines, it will just get worse for them. Now the project, um, uh, has uh, cut lots of mangroves, so as um we will go to that later on. And third point, the uh, San Miguel uh, Corporation took advantage of the COVID pandemic to speed up the project's progress. So when I uh, when I conducted a uh, workshop or a climate change training in Paobong, Bulacan, um, they they were the they were the recipients of this kind of social inequality that is very prevalent, not just here in the Philippines, but everywhere around the world. So during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic here in the Philippines, we had the longest lockdown and not just any kind of lockdown. It was a militarized lockdown. We could not leave our homes for, for almost a good year. So imagine how that will affect or how that affected the fishing community there in Bulacan. So they can't go out. They can't do their livelihood. They can't trade. They can't sell their products because everything was restricted back then. And because of that, San Miguel Cor Corporation saw that as an opportunity, saw that uh, very bad circumstances brought by, brought by the pandemic to offer, to offer uh, families, communities, 150 to 200,000 pesos in exchange for their homes and their livelihood. So for me, uh, when I uh, heard of that, I saw that San Miguel, that's how they value a person's life or you know, a family's worth, 150 to 200,000 pesos. And when you're in their situation, you're, you don't have stable livelihoods, you don't have, um, you don't have income, you will take that. And they did because the, the, the pandemic just worsened their situation. So they had to take it. Where will they get their food? Where will they get their um, their resources to survive? And then another note is that they discovered that the project has been expanded to 3,000 hectares instead of 2,500. So I don't know where the 500, the other 500 uh, hectares will be for, but yeah, it will include more rivers, more mangroves, more fishery. Now, moving towards the environmental impacts, the picture that you can see here is just one of the few instances of illegal cutting of mangroves in the area in 20. Now, for the environmental impacts, first is the eradication of mangroves, which will pose you know, a big problem not just for the environment, but of course for the people's um, ability to cope with climate change, with flooding. Because mangroves are a natural sea wall. You know, they they were they are the ones who absorb lots of the impacts of strong winds, of 
surges, of currents, and, and of course, flooding. So if you remove those mangroves, it will become a threat multiplier, not just for the, uh, not just the community, but of course, for us who live nearby, because it will have compounding effects when you remove these natural systems that protect us from the devastating impact of climate change. Next, mangroves serve as a habitat, as a habitat for first migratory birds. Okay, so every year more than 60 million water birds uh, travel through the Philippines. It is one of the world's biggest migratory bird flight paths, according to lots of environmental groups. And of course, birds in the area are, are a very good indicator of you know good environment, like frogs. When you see frogs in your in your football fields, you know it's a sign that oh, it's a good uh, it's cleaner here because you know they can, they can you know complicate here. So first, if you remove the mangroves, the birds will lose habitat, and of course for my for migratory birds, they will uh, lose their stopovers. So of course they have to travel for days to be able to move from one place to another. Imagine you're driving for seven to eight hours without any stopovers. What do you think will happen? You can get a accident because you're tired, you're hungry. So you can, you know, it, it poses a lot uh, lots of risks. So the same principle apply to migratory birds. If they lose these mangroves where they can rest, they can feed, and then they just move and fly, fly for days, most likely they will die from starvation and exhaustion and, and exhaustion because they don't have a place to rest. Next, of course, is the impact on um, aquatic species and mangrove serves as a very, very rich air for fish. And if you remove their habitats where you know they can also get uh, get food, they will also they will also um, migrate. They will also move to new places and. Again, if you, you move to a new place, to a new country, you're different culturally, socially, it's going to be hard for you to adjust. So again, that principle applies to the aquatic species who migrate. Moving to a new environment, they are not used to it. Most likely, they will suffer and then they will die. So that will lead to further biodiversity loss. And there have been accounts of further water pollution in and around the area. Even though, uh, for those in the Philippines here, know that Manila Bay is, is you know, has, has lots of pollution from plastic, from factories. The current construction activities of this airport project has caused further water pollution, where fisher folk cannot see the clear water anymore. It, it has become redder, uh, muddier. And of course, again, um, removing these vital mangrove species, which Bulacan has 22 species of, it will just, again, have compounding impacts uh, on floods, especially, of course, that will threaten the lives of people, which we do not want. So for a short uh, recommendation, of course, uh, we know that the project is now ongoing. So we just have to continue our pressure to stop these projects to get the foundations of our basis that this project violates these laws and these rights, we need to use that, we need to elevate that to a higher level or to use that for our movement and campaigns to stop the project. Then, if, of course, if that peaceful um, way doesn't work, we need to also um, do the legal remedies, the legal ways to stop this, uh, this project. Because again, it's a, Massive project that is that will just post lots of threats that we don't know yet. So we need to act, you know, as a as um as environmentalists, we need to act for air caution, the preventive and then precautionary principle of um, environmental laws. The last is to bring labor, environmental, and human rights issues to the international level to seek greater support to stop the project. I. Notice that the current administration, President Marcos Jr., is very se sensitive to how the international community sees him. So compared to the former Duterte administration, he has, you know, 
quite a smaller chance to cave into international pressure. So because of course he, he cares about how the how the how the international communities sees him. And we have um, I think this can be a um a basis that he vetoed the special economic zone in Bulacan, which um entails the the entails the rights to the companies to you know to uh to control that area. So we have established that precedent that he can veto these kinds of laws. So he has again a, a quite smaller chance compared to um compared to the former administration to cave into international pressure to stop the project. Now going on to Ati Shirley's video or Shirley Masurka's video. So she, again she she is a spoke uh, for a person for P and and she has been um, helping uh, Fisher folk in Bulacan to, of course, defend their lives, life, homes, and of course the environment. So now let's go to her video. Let me just share my computer sound and playing it now. Um, para sa akin ang issue dito ngayon sa talipi tungkol sa kapagbigan ay dahil nga po sa pagtatayo ng airport kaya po malaki pong effect ko sa mga manglisda nagkaroon ng pag, uh, paghina ng huli ng mga manglisda uh, pagka pagkalayo-layo ng mga manglisda nag, nagbago ang mga hanapuhay ng mga manglisda kaya po napakahirap para sa manglisda ang sinapit ngayon ng mga mamamayan na dating nasa postal Ah, uh, sa amin ang ginagawa ng organization sa mga ng mangingisda ng Bulacan ay uh, pinilit namin na abutin yung mga taong may kaugnayan sa mga naapekto uh, at ng ng reklamasyon. Unang-una inalam namin kung ano nga ba ang dapat naming uh, kailangan na ibigay nilang suporta sa amin dahil kami yung naapektuhan. At lumapit din kami sa gobyerno para alamin din namin kung ano ang dapat nilang gawin sa aming mga mamamayan na katamaan ng projects at napiktuhan ng kanilang pagre pagreklamasyon, pagbago ng katubigan. Pero wala pa pong, walang tuon po ang gobyerno kundi puro po ang San Miguel ang, ang nagpapaliwanag na hindi naman po sapat para sa mga minisda ang paliwanag nila. Ayun, uh, ang ano ng mangingisda ay dapat kung ano yung pinangako ng taga San Miguel sa mga mangingisda ay ito pa rin dapat nila. Kaya lang, sa dami ng mga taong napiktuhan, ang mga pangako nila halos wala naman silang matupad. At marami po ngayon sa mga mangingisda na dating mangingisda sa patangkita, hindi naghihirap, hindi nagkawaon baon sa utang ngayon, baon na sa utang dahil ang hanap buhay ay... Yung iba sa kontraksyon na lang, yung iba naman sa dagat pa rin nagtitiis kahit wala na masyadong mahuli. Kaya napakahirap po ng buhay ng mga mangingisda ngayon kumpara sa dating buhay ng masagana. Para sa akin, ang rekomendasyon ko para sa gobyerno ay dapat hindi po basta-basta na lang sila po mapayag na meron pong itatayong isang negosyo sa isang sa isang lugar tapos hindi po man lang nila sinangguni din sa mamamayan. Dahil una-una pong maapektuhan ang mga taong bayan at yung mga uh, pinakamalapit po talaga doon sa pinaka uh, project na tatamaan. At dapat din po siguro ang gobyerno, um, um, puro po salita, aksyonan din po nila yung mamamayan, tulungan din po nila. Huwag po nilang iasa lang sa mga tao na nangangako sa taas sa mga mamamayan na tutukunan dahil hindi naman po agad-agad natutupad iyon. Bilang isang mamamayan, kung sila, kung para sa akin, dapat ang sa gobyerno, eh hinangal sila ng taong bayan para makatulong sila sa taong bayan. Hindi sila hinangal para lalong papaghirapin yung taong bayan. Sa akin, kasi dati na kami talaga natamaan kami yung pinakaunang natamaan ng project na yan. At kami din po ang pinaka unang uh, unang na, na nalipat ba, unang bayan, uh, unang mga na relocate 
bagamat ang medyo pinagkaiba lang po ay dahil kami naman na eh, nahuli kami sa lahat ng nerelocit dahil ang hinanap namin sa sa San Miguel ay yung bigyan nila kami ng kabahay at lupa. At sawa naman ng Diyos, natupad naman yun sa dami ng naman din ng sakripis yung naranasan namin at paghihirap bago namin naabot at bago namin nakamit. Katakot-takot na hirap ang inabot namin at kung saan-saan kami mga taong mga may katungkulan lumapit para lang po maipabot ang aming hinain at para maibigay yung aming kahilingan na ang hiling namin pabahay at tubig kuryente na may may titulo ang aming lupa at higit sa lahat hiniling namin na panghabang buhay na trabaho na hindi pa po nabibigay sa amin hanggang ngayon bagamat meron naman po silang binigay sa amin na kaunting tulong na sinasabi nilang ano uh, transitional so support para sa aming mga naapektuhan, hindi pa rin po sapat dahil uh, iba po ang buhay ngayon na nandito na sa, sa baryo kumpara dati sa dagat kasi ang sa dagat napakasimple at napaka 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 easy lang po ng buhay na wala ka masyadong iniintindi, malawa ka masyadong uh, pinoproblema kasi nga araw-araw kumikita at araw-araw din po naghahanap buhay yung mga tao bukod sa ganong araw-araw kumikita ay hindi na rin po kami nangangailangan na bumili pa ng mga ulam dahil ang ulam na sa dagat lang at araw-araw din po nahuhuli yun. Yun po yung hinahanap-hanap namin ngayon dito sa baril, hindi na po nangyayari sa ngayon. At para sa akin, gabis po talaga ang manginisda sa Bulacan kung hindi po sila napaalis. Wala pong paghihirap mararanasan ang manginisda dahil ang uh, Napakaswerte swerte po ng mga manisda sa Bulacan dahil ang Bulacan po na tinamaan ng tagit ay napakayaman sa mga sa mga seaports at, at talaga namang pinapakanibangan po ng mga manisda sa Bulacan. Na ngayon, hindi na nila masyadong napakinabangan dahil na po sa apektado ito ng reklamasyon at malaki na din ang pinagbago. Okay, uh, that is after for this video and thank you everyone for listening. Hope you learned something. Thank you so much, Paolo. Thank you so much, Cheryl, that was giving us a picture of how reclamation from the seas and how this water, the bloodline uh, of our life, of our livelihood been impacted by this project, government projects in partnership with different investments has really uh, made changes on how we live our life, how we use our resources, and how we look at uh, the future uh, when this change is affecting the water will happen. So from reclamation, let's move to rehabilitation. Uh, our next speaker, uh, is an Ogoni-born human and environmental rights and campaigner and the national coordinator of the Ogoni Solidarity Forum all the way from Nigeria. After the Shell Petroleum Developed Company destroyed the Ogoni land for over five decades, the people are now in an uphill struggle on how to reclaim their healthy lands, their healthy rivers, their water, their livelihood, and their life. So how does a community uh, live in the mining water pollution and how they can move forward for a people-centered rehabilitation? So let's all welcome, give a hand to our friend Celestina Kobari, all the way from the Ogoniland, Nigeria. Hello, Celestine. Hello, Comrade Paul. Um... Other comrades here. I hope you are hearing me. Yes, we can hope hear you. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm sorry that I will, I will not be able to um, show you pictures, but I will. I think uh, Comrade Paul will share the pictures later of the kind of uh, water that we drink in Ogoni. Um, 
I, as you may have heard in the news, Nigeria has uh, had an election, the presidential election and the local elections, we just ended on Saturday the 18th. I think collations and announcements are still ongoing. So I was sleeping when um, I just woke up. It's um, so five in Nigeria, five a.m. now, it's going to five. So um, the story about your Ogoni people is, 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 is out there because um, I don't think there is anywhere in the world where uh, a government and the oil companies have um, treated a people like they have done in Ogoni. Um, I mean, I'm talking about an area where um, almost all the communities, not almost, every community in the Niger Delta, where I come from, including Ogoni, does not have one single spot where you can say this is portable drinking water. The oil companies that pollute our river, that empty their waste into our river, that commit all sorts of atrocities, work hand in hand with government, does not care about the human being. In fact, in their mind and in their thinking, the human being are, are constituting an obstruction to their, to their money because all they think about is profit. I mean, it is, it is a shame that Nigeria, that pride ourselves, you know, to uh, be an oil producing nation, that the citizens cannot drink water, they cannot drink portable water. Up to this moment, the Ogoni people, in spite of all that has happened, in spite of the death sentence, because I call the UNEP report on Ogoni a death sentence. So if you look at that report, a report states, maybe I should let you know how, how UNEP came. You know, after the devastation and the killings in Ogoni, the United Nations came to do an environmental audit. They did, did an assessment of the Ogoni environment. And the report they came out with states that the water that the Ogoni people drink has benzene a cancer-causing carcinogen in the water that we drink. The report is online. Um, you never report on Ogoni is online. I can even send the link to comment for that we share it. And that there is um, every water taken, apart from the fat and the benzene, is coated with HCM or crude oil. It's coated with HCM or crude oil. And so, um, People that are drinking water and bathing water that is coated with ACM of crude oil. For all these years, you can just imagine the damages that are coming into the body system. And that's why in Ogoni, death has become a carnival. Like every weekend, you cannot count the number of deaths. And, and I'm not talking about loss of livelihoods. Lots of livelihoods is taken for granted because even if fishes were to be made in iron, iron can't, they can't survive in the kind of river that we have in Ogoni because polluted, uh, pollution has, has occurred for over five decades, unattended to. Nobody has cleaned them. Nobody has done anything. And because human beings must drink water if you are thirsty, we have no, we have no choice. You must drink it. People bad, bad in it, but the, life, the loss of livelihood is the worst because all the mangrove forests have been removed completely. They have died on their own, only storms. You see the storms because we have tidal movement of the water. Sometimes the water will come and it will go. So when the water ebbs, you will see storms. That is the only thing that will let you know that there were mangroves there. So you can just imagine, and mangroves are the breeding ground for fishes and all this um, aquatic life. So if you don't have mangrove, how do you go to fish? I mean, so the, you can just imagine what we are going through in the Niger Delta and Ogoni. And, and 
And, and I think that, you know, um, this meeting should be able, you know, to, to spotlight this, this very particular issue because um, this is not a local uh, issue. It's an international one, an issue that has brought, you know, the attention of the UN. It's not a local problem. UNEP actually, you know, did a report. So I think that um, a, a, a situation of um, an emergency should be declared in Ogoni and the whole of Niger Delta, an emergency should be declared because um, as we speak, the oil companies haven't destroyed everything. I'm beginning now to think about migrating to the ocean, offshore. They want to leave the community area where they have completely devastated the land and the environment and destroy our livelihoods. They are now migrating offshore where human beings will not see them, where nobody will see them anymore. So I, I, I think that um, from this meeting today, we should be able to spotlight the Niger Delta area, Ogoni land and the Niger Delta area in Nigeria, because I don't think there is anywhere in the world that are going through what the Ogoni people and Niger Delta people are going through today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Celestine. Uh, you know the the, the 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 issue of the pollution from reclamation to rehabilitation. As Celestine has said, it's not a local issue. Remember how water is connected from the sea to the rivers, from one country to another, and so uh, these issues are challenges that are not also isolated but very much linked. It's like uh, the water systems that, that, that we rely on. And so our movement, our actions, our pledges, and of course, our struggle should also be connected. And think, that's why thank you so much, uh, Celestine. So moving on uh, to our next presenter. Uh, as you have noticed earlier, you know, uh, the, the, the sharing of our speakers always turns to mention on how the issue of keeping the water clean and accessible and serving the needs of the people, this challenge is usually linked to an issue of rights violations in terms of the communities and the people that try to achieve and protect uh, this right. So our next speaker, uh, someone who has uh, worked more than a decade uh, uh, working in the community, mobilization and education and organizing, is currently the executive director of the Center for Environmental Concerns Philippines and also CEC, the Secretariat of the Asia Pacific Network of Environment Defenders, or APNET, uh, which work as a solidarity campaign network of organizations working on environmental advocacy in defense of environmental human rights defenders. So let's listen on how water defenders and environment defenders face such challenges and work together to overcome this. Let's all welcome Leah Torres. Hello, Leah. Hi, thank you, Paul. And um, hello again to everyone who's here with us today. Uh, let's, let me just put up my slide. So as Paul mentioned, I will be discussing about water and environmental human rights defenders. Since um, the Asia Pacific Network of Environment Defenders focuses on um, environmental rights and uh, defending as well our environmental defenders. So first of all, let us define who are, who are uh, environmental human rights defenders. Uh, according to the United Nations, they are individuals and groups who in their personal or professional capacity and in a peaceful manner, strive to protect and promote human rights relating to the environment, including water, air, land, flora, and fauna. So particularly, um, Indigenous people also uh, describe water defenders as human rights defenders 
particularly water protectors, are activists, organizers, and cultural workers focused on the defense of the world's water and water systems. So what is the situation now of our water resources? So human, uh, at the global context, uh, human activities that have caused climate change and pollution are causing the strain on our water resources. Uh, this caused uh, different kinds of conflict that widens inequality and widens inequality and also prevents our progress towards just transition. Currently, 771 million people lack access to clean water. So this is actually the reason why we call this a water crisis is so much people are already being affected and lives at our stake, not just the environment. So uh, when it comes to water uh, defenders context, particularly indigenous people, um, consider that uh, natural water systems and resources are tied to their identity, specifically because uh, water resources are very important for their livelihood, uh, such as those related to agriculture, as well as those for domestic use. Uh, it is also very much tied to their culture, since uh, many of their traditions um, are also related to their water resources. So as um, Paolo mentioned earlier, development aggression not only exists in specific countries, but all over the world. And then um, this is dri driven by resource exploitation for profit that threatens of water sources, particularly for indigenous people in their ancestral domains. So this profit-driven so-called development projects have caused the privatization of water resources. So it affects the access of local communities to these water resources. So um, I would like to focus now on specific cases in Southeast Asia. These can be found in our publication, Reclaiming the Narrative, which I will be, which I can post later in the chat. No? So first are large dams. Large dams um, block the natural flow of rivers. Uh, this causes the um, harms in the natural processes of aquatic animals and other organisms um, in these uh, riverine and aquatic ecosystems. So there are negative consequences on freshwater ecosystems because of the usual uh, sediment flow is blocked. So this affects the nutrient cycling from the upstream to the downstream ecosystems. Uh, dams are also expensive. Many countries are already uh, stopping using large dams and they have been decommissioning dams since it takes so much resources to remove the sediments from the dams that have um, accumulated over time. And uh, these dams are also prone to the uh, failures and spillage causing disasters as um, was mentioned earlier by G10. And um, it also promotes the privatization of water since dams uh, close up these sources of water, affecting upstream and downstream communities. So all these things uh, contribute to the worsening and existing, uh, worsening the existing social inequalities. So an example is uh, the proposed dam in the Salwin River, which is found in Myanmar. Uh, so the Salwin River uh, has about 10 million uh, people from 13 ethnic groups that are dependent on it for livelihood and cultural and spiritual practices. Um, it is uh, the proposed dam is called Hatgi Dam, um, that is a 1,350 megawatt dam that is within the Karen Indigenous Peoples area. So the project uh, will be funded by Electricity Generating Authority of Thailand International Corporation and also the Sino Hydro Corporation Limited from China. Uh, it is seen. It is seen that uh, it may, it might cause the flooding of two wildlife sanctuaries in Myanmar. Potential altering of the sediment and natural flows will impact the biodiversity in the Salween River. Um, it might also worsen the existing conflict since there are um, existing conflict with, between the 
Karen Liberation Army and the government troops. Also, um, the project has caused, um, sorry. The project has caused numerous human rights violations due to its continued push from the investors. This includes militarization, uh, displacement, forced labor, and also incidences of rape. Another activity that has that has um, damaged our water sources um, are large-scale mining operations. Um, these operations have prolonged and high levels of water pollution coming from the mine tailings. Uh, many operations also need a large amount of water to process ores, therefore affecting the water supply um, for surrounding communities. The mining activities that involve removing soil, rocks, and vegetation to extract the desired minerals has compounding effects on biodiversity. So an example is um, the mining operations of Oceana Gold Philippines in the village of Didipio in the province of Nueva Vizcaya in the Philippines. So there are 3,902 individuals and 833 households located in Didipio. Most of them are from the Bukalot and Tuwali indigenous peoples group. So the mining operations of Oceana Gold um, in Nueva Vizcaya can be found in the Adalam uh, River watershed that is an important biodiversity corridor in the northern part of the Philippines. So their permit to mine actually expired in 2019, but was renewed for another 25 years. So that is until 2044, despite opposition from local communities, environmental advocates, and other organizations at the national level. So it was found by independent investigations that there are high levels of copper contamination found in the water sources near the Didipo River. But this is denied by Oceana Gold, claiming that other small-scale miners are the one causing this pollution. And um, there is heavy depletion of wet, uh, freshwater resources um, that has affected the access rights of locals to clean water and livelihood. So the wells uh, in many parts of the villages have dried up already, affecting um, their water so uh, water supply for domestic use and also for um, irrigation for their farms. Downstream um, resources are also affected um, because of uh, suspected chemical seeping from the mine tailings. So aside from these environmental and social uh, impacts, they have also had other human rights violations. According to the investigation of the Philippine Commission on Human Rights in 2011, um, Oceana Gold violated five human rights, um, uh, such as um, access, to, um, uh, access to water resources and also um, homes and um, livelihood and sections of the 1987 constitution and other laws. In 2012, a mother and her cousin and law were killed by unidentified gunmen and um, local communities uh, link this to the mining operation since they are known to be anti-mining advocates. In 2018, 27 individuals who opposed the mines were falsely accused and vilified as being part of the New People's Army of the, of the Communist Party of the Philippines. So we call this um, red tagging or the uh, process of the government of naming individuals and organizations as communists and terrorists. This is one of the most dangerous attacks that we see um, in the Philippines because this is often a prelude to further attacks or worse attacks. So um, what can we see uh, that are the main trends in the different incidences related to water? So the lack of access to clean and potable water has resulted in conflict. Human activities, particularly that of large corporations that profit from water resources are often related to the water crisis. 
And individuals and organizations and communities that seek to uphold their rights are often faced with repression, um, leading us to um, the summary that if we want to protect our uh, natural resources, particularly water resources, we should also protect our environmental human rights defenders. So in the uh, Asia Pacific Environmental Human Rights Defenders Forum conducted in 2022, the, these following recommendations were given by the participants. First, um, environmental rights enabling civic spaces and accountability must be reinforced at the national and regional levels. Second, while participation of civil society in any decision-making process is essential, the perspectives of indigenous people have to be specifically considered. Third, traditional governance and culture needs to be respected when environmental impact assessments are conducted. And there needs to be a monetary mechanism for civil society organizations on the implementation of their recommendations. And lastly, that the voices of the people from affected communities need to be reflected um, any of their opinions presented ahead of the consultation should be incorporated. And uh, we believe uh, that these recommendations can all um, only be forwarded or implemented if there is sufficient uh, pressure from environmental human rights defenders um, in the region. So I hope that these kinds of activities like the forum that we're having now would, um, be, would not be the last engagement among environmental human rights defenders, but inspire further action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah, and for making it clear to everyone that we have zero tolerance to any human rights violations that trample our rights and the rights of our rivers, our right to be clean and safe uh, water sources and water management. Thank you so much, Leah and Apned. So for our next speaker, uh, we're, we're going to go down to the Pacific, to a country that is surrounded by the bodies of water. So our next speaker, our friend Stephen Stephens, is here, a longtime uh, children and climate is a worker and activist and part of the Vanuatu Climate Action Network to share about the, their experience uh, in the Pacific, in Vanuatu, and the current work and the issues and maybe the best practices and commitments they can share uh, on, uh, on their context. So let's all welcome uh, Stephanie. Thank you, Paul. Sorry. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night to you all. My name is Stephanie Stevens. I am from Vanuatu. I work at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Thank you, IPM STL, for the opportunity to uh, share the perspective of the, uh, the Pacific, especially Vanuatu, on this virtual site event. I will also speak um, in this session on behalf of the active local based network called Vanuatu Climate Action Network. I am happy to be among the distinguished speakers and expert access to what safe water, sanitation, and hygiene is underlined by the SDG 6 uh, is the most uh, basic human need uh, for health and well-being. For that perspective, water is one of the fundamental human rights and its access must be people-centered for human well-being. However, billions of people will lack access to these basic services in 2030 unless progress quadruples and action are taken. Demand for water is rising owing to um, rapid population growth, urbanization, and increasing water needs for, from agriculture, um, industries, and energy sectors. In the Pacific small island developing state, Access to water has, is becoming challenging for coastal communities and inland communities, uh, as it is damaged by the devastating impacts of climate change through sea, sea level rise for coastal community and flooding and cyclones for the inland communities. So um, the Republic of Vanuatu is an island nation 
located in the South Pacific Ocean, Vanuatu. Okay, so I think we're having some uh, difficulty. Recently, we have been hit by two tropical cyclones, uh, category four. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if it's slow, video first, maybe, uh, because we can hear you clearly. If that's okay. Okay, so I think we will get her back. <laughs> I'll just fix her internet. Uh, for Stephanie sharing, and think of your questions, your inputs. to get uh, your questions to our speakers or maybe sharing or give you, uh, we hope to have very clear and precise questions. We'll try to give you uh, a, a minute and a half maybe so we can uh, maximize everyone's participation. Of course, uh, because this water conference is really directed towards getting clear actions and commitments uh, from different sectors, specifically to our governments and states as uh, there is really a emergency, a need to act now uh, on, on, on how we can achieve uh, and have clean water, uh, people-centered uh, water management, and, and how we can uh, achieve this given the the many issues that we are facing now in terms of development, of climate, uh, the livelihood of the people, the welfare of the community. So Stephanie's back, I think. Stephanie, can you hear us? Yes, I am so sorry. Okay. I cannot, yeah, I cannot That's put okay. my camera That's on. Okay. You can move, you can, you can continue now. I'm so sorry, okay. Um, so, I'll just put off my camera, I'll just continue, sorry. Um, so um, yes, as I was saying, um, the Republic of Vanuatu is located in the South Pacific Ocean. Vanuatu is an archipelago with uh, around 83 islands, small islands divided into six provinces. Recently, we got hit by uh, two tropical cyclones, category four, on the first March and the fourth March this uh, yeah recently. So this has caused a lot of damage on two of the provinces of Vanuatu. Um, now I'm going to talk about the Vanuatu government water action. So the Vanuatu government and other stakeholders working in the area of water, um, also with the help of developing partners uh, ensuring the strengthening of enhanced water supplies and system over the years. So the Vanuatu government has developed a Vanuatu national water policy, uh, which is currently ongoing from 2017 to 2030. 
uh, that seeks to deliver, or it is also linked with the Vanuatu National Sustainable Development Plan, uh, which is currently ongoing since 2016 to 2030. Um, and this Vanuatu National Sustainable Development Plan is also um, established to achieve the sustainable development goal. Um, and as we speak on right now on SDG six on clean water and sanitation. So with that Vanuatu national policy established to strengthen um, the accountability of the um, institution necessary to secure a safe, sufficient, accessible and affordable, reliable and sustainable source of water for all. So um, I'm going to talk about what already exists and what um, uh, what is not existed in Vanuatu in terms of uh, water safety and security and what needs to be done, what to do. So um, firstly, what's, what has already existed here in the country? Access to drinking water here in Vanuatu increase over the Millennium Development Goal period. So with a percentage of 94% um, percent of the population having access to an improved drinking water source. So there's piped water. The piped water is the most popular form of access uh, yeah, to water, primarily followed by uh, access to rainwater. So an, <clears throat> an increase prevalence of uh, household water treatment, particularly in urban areas, suggests that the safety of drinking water is not guaranteed. So with the impact of climate change associated with the recent um, tropical cyclone, drought, uh, prolonged rainy season, has also revealed that rainwater dependency and a lack of storage undermine the security of uh, sufficient uh, quantity of water. So um, what doesn't exist yet in Vanuatu, so in the absence of a robust drinking water quality testing, um, the quality of drinking water consumed by the majority of the population of Vanuatu is unknown. So um, we also have consequences on health, especially for children. This also affect uh, agriculture for local root crops cannot grow or there's a lot of water. So they rot in, yeah, on, in the ground. And um, they have, uh, this also have consequence in the sustainability of forest reserve and coastal area. Um, the lack of any enforceable limits of abstraction or use of water resources, the severe impact of climate change and inadequate storage of water suggests that drinking um, water security will be major challenge in the future. So uh, what needs to be done? Uh, the primary role of the government is to ensure the safe consumption of uh, sufficient water for all. This means either ensuring the residu uh, residual uh, safety of water supply to consumer or ensuring appropriate household treatment of water, not safe at the point um, of supply. Uh, it also means identify identifying and reinforcing water protection and buffer zones to, to secure the safety and sufficiency of water. Um, this may also include anticipating and promoting investments that increase the ability to access stored water. Um, so in Vanuatu, all the WASH project, most, most of all the WASH project in Vanuatu is supported by UNICEF among other INGOs and local NGOs involving um, construction of infrastructure such as water tanks, pumps and toilets, um, uh, yeah, along with education of good hygiene practices to the communities. 
So one of the main challenges is that the water system uh, in Vanuatu um, is not climate proof. So with the impact of climate change, the sea level rise that induce salt water intrusion into the underground well for the community makes it very difficult for them to have uh, access to drinkable water. Uh, there's also another impact of climate change, which is drought that also can reduce the level of underground water and poses issues on agriculture and food security. Um, and also for the prolonged rainy season, that also causing floodings that uh, destroy infrastructure and essential services, such as school, hospitals, market, and houses. So some of the best practices, to conclude, some of the best practices that I wanted to share is um, some of the project that um, came in Vanuatu. We have uh, nature-based solution projects. We also have integrated land and coastal management projects. That is very essential because it has a component in this project that mentioned that buffer zones are very good. We need to include or we need to uh, do more awareness on that for, uh, in the communities so that um, they can understand that they should not be building houses near rivers, doing um, gardens near rivers to reduce soil erosion and landslide and flooding as well. So um, another best practices for Vanuatu, we also have the Vanuatu Climate Action Network supporting all of the members, the community members at the grassroots level to access climate finance uh, for restoration of forest and environmental protection that address the impact of climate change on water. So this is also good that we have um, more and more of um, community taking ownership to protect their, their own environment, uh, the indigenous people taking ownership to protect their own environments, uh, that's the water source. So uh, community has also protected the environment, endemic species, um, and directly uh, protect the water source by setting up protected land reserve and community conservation areas. So um, yes, to finalize, to conclude uh, my uh, uh, short speech, I wanted to say that the Vanuatu government has at the national level developed the water policy, some of the strategy, some of the frameworks, and also encourage and strengthen the provincial level um, to uh, find how to implement some of the strategies and some of the policies, sorry, and also um, uh, other stakeholders helping also the community to implement some of the safety, water safety um, in the water policy. I think I am done now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, that, was, that was good and share on how, uh, what, what, what are the uh, challenges that need to be done, how we can improve access to water, especially in a special place like Vanuatu, uh, impacted uh, mainly by uh, climate change and how the, the, the issues living in coastal areas is really uh, something to consider in, in terms of pushing on how people can have access to clean and people-centered uh, water sources. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So it's time for our uh, open forum for our questions. We'd like to ask everyone if you have any questions to, uh, you, you can uh, write it in the chat box or you can raise your hand and we'll call you. We'll give you a minute and a half to uh, address your question. But before that, uh, let's uh, watch this video first to give you time to think uh, of your questions. Uh, and then later on, we will call our speakers to, uh, to, to, to answer some of the uh, questions or input. So, okay, uh, I'm ready. So let's watch this video. Uh, Danum, meaning water uh, from the people of Cordillera, the northernmost part of the Philippines. <laughs>
for that uh, wonderful song performance from the people of Cordillera the Dijon Stigarot in the northern more, most part of the Philippines thank you Salido my DKK for that wonderful song uh, the noom meaning water and as you have said earlier this discussion this water conference is so much timely since we just celebrated the International Day of Action for Rivers against large dams which Uh, started 1997, where a lot of Daijin's peoples, local communities, communities depending their livelihood and lives on rivers, come together in Brazil to make a stand, to make a demand, to make to take action on how to protect their rivers. And until today, we are here gathering our commitments, gathering our resolve to to continue the fight. For uh, clean rivers, rivers that will benefit uh, our people, our communities. So we have some questions here, uh, and we 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 would like to ask our speakers to you know uh, turn on their video so uh, we can see you all. The first question I think is uh, directed to G10. Uh, and those who have shared about dams and Leah, maybe this is uh, from our friend Willie Misa from Vanuatu. Hello, Willie. Mm. Uh, what is the approach to stop the dam constructions, knowing that each country's jurisdiction are different and need to be protected? Uh, I think this concerns on dams that uh, and rivers and projects that cut across boundaries of different cr- countries. G10, uh, what do you say about this? Yeah, uh, because uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, when we look at the approach, uh, I think we also need to address the first and foremost is to address the challenges of dam. No, because uh, we should not limit or focus only on the impact of dam. Because but then we also need to see 
the other dimension of dam building. For example, uh, in, in Northeast India, what we're seeing is a lot of the dams are underperformed and, and failed actually. So that is uh, a reality. And then we are also seeing an increase uh, unviability of dam. Uh, the, like Leah has mentioned, now dams are becoming too expensive to build. No? And then when you look at the expense of dam, it is not just a financial expense. Uh, it is also, if you look at the climate cost, if you look at the impact on the social cost, impact on people, if you look at the cost on the environment, the destruction, uh, the, the, the cost extremely colossal. So, um, so I think uh, it's, uh, it's high time that we stop uh, calling for, um, uh, you know, uh, we, we call for the stop of the dam building in the region. Um, and then, you know, dams are also big source of corruption and manipulation, uh, apart from uh, dams are also um, bad for the environment. So I think there are so many uh, aspects that we need to consider. And now what we are also seeing is um, there are a lot more uh, alternatives, sustainable alternatives, um, you know, like in India, for example, um, now in India, for example, the solar energy has become much more cheaper when it comes to compare to dam building. So which means uh, we can actually push for more um, solar and other hybrid, um, you know, that can actually minimize the impact on the people and the environment. So it's high time that we, 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 we strengthen our call to stop dam building uh, due to its myriad impact. Um, yeah, so, so in terms of the approach, uh, you know, the community voice is really, really strong, but also to continuously highlight this different aspect of uh, dams, no? um, and then of course the collaboration, the cooperation, the solidarity among the communities who are affected uh, all over. Uh, and also linking up with people who are affected in a downstream area, because uh, often and oftentimes we focus uh, a lot more on the direct impact uh, in upstream areas, no, yeah, upstream of the dam. But the impact is also very much uh, in the downstream areas, uh, like in in the case of Manipur, uh, the Tipaimu Dam. Uh, if you see the Tipaimu Dam, the resistance against Tipaimu Dam, the the community voice against Tipaimu Dam, uh, is not limited only to the ones uh, who will be directly submerged or displaced. But uh, the voice against the Paimung Dam also comes from uh, a lot of the community from the downstream area in Assam state, in India, but also from the Bangladesh um, area. So which means um, if there, uh, there are transboundary rivers like the Mekong River in the Mekong region, the Brahmaputra, which are transboundary river, I think it's extremely important that uh, different communities will live along the river, uh, coordinate, collaborate, uh, and extend solidarity to each other. No? Uh, and I think that's extremely important. Uh, another strategy uh, approach, uh, which is extremely important now, is as I also said, uh, now dam building increasingly also involves financing from the World Bank, ADB, and other financial institutions. Uh, also involve the private sector, and then also involve a lot of the climate-related uh, uh, groups, no, uh, climate funders, and so many other governments. So you know, so we, so we also need to reach out to all these multiple uh, stakeholders, no, or multiple um, uh, groups: the, the government, the financiers, the, uh, the international finance institutions, the multinational companies the financial groups, no? the climate financiers, and all these groups. So we should reach out to all the other stakeholders that are increasingly involved uh, in the construction of last time. Yeah, but what? But the foremost is to strengthen the community voice, to, to, to maintain consistency, uh, and then also highlight the multiple impact of last time. And I think that is extremely important. And solidarity building and strengthening our resistance and uh, yeah, and uh, building more uh, strength. And I think that's uh, the strongest approach, uh, which is uh, really, really important. Thank you. Thank you, Jitan. Leah, anything to add to that? No. Uh, dams, different rivers, different countries, same project. Yes. Um, I think one of the important things that we should highlight is that there should be existing policies and mechanisms that covers these uh, various countries. So for example, if we have one river that crosses many countries, we know, as mentioned, there are different policies, but then again, it is important that there is um, like an intergovernmental policy to address this. If there is still no uh, such um, policy, it is important that um, citizens from these countries would push for one. Um, I, I think it's 
going to be a strong basis if you want to file, for example, cases for en environmental damages or socioeconomic damages. Um, second is that, as um, Jitan mentioned, there are uh, various financial institutions or corporations that operate in different parts of the country and also have the similar impact. So um, what can help is to find the mechanisms that can be um, that the, these companies cover. For example, um, there are like the OECD guidelines or business human rights guidelines um, that covers corporations. Um, and there might be grievance uh, mechanisms that we can address. There are also international human rights mechanisms. For example, the United Nations Special Rapporteurs um, that cover various themes, for example, access to uh, water and um, uh, also uh, regarding environment and human rights and also environmental uh, human rights defenders. So we can also report to them so they can help us um, push for government the government's action. And um, lastly, uh, it's important that civil society organizations across uh, these countries would also help each other. So they can support each other if they want to launch national campaigns or for regional campaigns, for example. That's um, what we would like to uh, do here in the Asia-Pacific Network of Environmental Defenders, or APNED, to provide solidarity actions for uh, civil society organizations in different countries, but then again also to launch um, regional campaigns um, that uh, were in... Um, corporations that are affecting different countries can be targeted for those campaigns for particular demands and for particular calls to action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah. The solidarity of the people, how the community work together to access these mechanisms, to be to commit and to pledge to work and to, to watch out uh, on these guidelines and how to use it for the benefit of the community of the people it really depends on how active we work together. We work uh, together beyond boundaries, beyond our countries, working together as people, as people of uh, Asia, people of the world, even Africa. Thank you so much for that. So another question, uh, what happens when you know uh, we, uh, the, the people, indigenous peoples and communities has a very clear mindset uh, on how to protect their lives. And sometimes when, uh, when the government policies and mindset is different from it, how in, in your experience, how do you bridge this gap? Or how, uh, what, what are your experience on bringing the issue this is, uh, to make uh, the, the, the state or the companies accountable? It's one of the questions from our Manang Bernie from APWLD and from the Cordillera. Uh, what's your experience? How do you work when the, the government policy and action uh, could be different from how IPs and indigenous peoples communities work? How to bridge this, how to address this as a movement and how to bring uh, the issue, the challenges, uh, how to work on it. So maybe you can st start with uh, Celestine and then Paolo and then Stephanie. Celestine. Yeah. Comrade, Comrade Paul and um, other comrades. Um, the struggle, I hate to say that the struggle should continue. I hate, I hate to say that, but um, we have no choice if we have to keep the place for generations yet unborn, then we must continue to fight. And, and, and that's why, um, in spite of every effort the government and the oil companies have made to resume oil operation in Ogoni land. We have resisted such moves. It is not be easy to resist Shell and, and other multinationals and the government since we stopped oil production in 1993. And since cancer we was executed in 1995, it is, it's close to 10 30 years now, it's not easy, it's not easy. Because every time they come and divide the community, they apply the bar and rule, they give money to people. People are hungry. You know, they have weaponized hunger because when they have destroyed their means of livelihood, 
you become very vulnerable, you are hungry. So the oil companies come and dangle carrots, give money to um, people who are hungry to say, come and take oil. So you can see the, the, the problem that some of us are going through. They say, ah, comrade, please, let I allow them to take the oil so we can eat. This oil has been in the ground for 30 years. This oil has been in the ground. Why are you being stubborn? Why? Are you, but I mean, we are concerned about what the community Ogoni are going through because of the oil extraction that happened in the past. We are yet to recover from it. I've always said that cancer of would have been alive today if Ogoni never had oil. Over 2,000 persons that died in Ogoni would have been alive. I'm not talking about those that are dying daily because they drink bad water. Because like I've always said, it's bad water that is killing of many people more than anything else now. Yeah, hunger kills. Uh, lack of having a means to take care of, of your kids. But water, when you are hungry and you see good water and you drink, it can hold you, it can sustain you. But have no access to water at all. I sent some photographs to Easter and the pub, to see our people swimming in very terrible, heavily polluted water. They are swimming, they drink it because there is no other alternative. And when your throat is dry, when you, want, when you are dehydrated and you want to take, what do you, what do you do? And so it is as bad as that. And I think, like I said before, whatever we can do, Command pressure on the Nigerian system and the world body to ensure that, because you've taken away everything that we have, to ensure that at least the people see water to drink is key to us. We've lost our land, we've lost means of livelihood. So there are a high rate of people that are unable to go to school anymore because the public school system has been destroyed. There is no public health system, no basic things are not there. It is money we, we get from our farms that we use to send our children to school, get food to eat and all that. But when the means have been destroyed completely and there's no government job, so people are dying. We need to you know, really raise this alarm one more time. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, Celestine. Paolo, uh, in your experience in the reclamation, what can we do? uh well i have to share the same sentiment with uh celestine that there is really not a lot that we can do right now but continue resisting continue to protect um and to continue to do whatever we can to help these projects while in our case um land uh, it's still ongoing there's still a long way to go before before that uh, project is built uh but <clears throat> impacts have you know it has already happened we cannot reverse that anymore we cannot um do much about it but these these uh impacts experienced by the by the fishing community there you know we can always bring that as a basis to be able to to stop the project and yeah we we have to work with what we have especially you know we have to work within the system, legal means, peaceful means. We cannot resort to anything other than that because you know we have to um we have to uh bring more uh so that we have to let the let those uh other people know that you know um we're doing whatever we can and uh, and that we just need to mount more support, especially for those fishing communities that um through through NGOs and C and CSOs to just continue the fight. And you know, if there's a small chance that we can, if there's still time that we can uh stop the projects, then we should take it. You know, it's it's always it, it uh there's always going to be lessons from these from these experiences and if if we do not succeed then we can just use these lessons for future campaigns for future movement for future projects thank you so much Paolo. stephanie uh on your experience when when, when the grassroots 
work uh, could not be uh, fully in sync with the government's policy and programs. How do you work around this? Okay, thank you, Paul, for the question. I think I will um, say that uh, the context of Vanuatu is very different uh, from other Pacific uh, islands and also for my colleagues here online. I would say that if uh, things are not working at the grassroots level, as um, the Vanuatu Climate Action Network, we believe in individual change. So this is one of the main things that we're trying to uh, um, do more awareness and talk more in the communities, uh, but not to chiefs and uh, adults and so on, but to talk to children and youth, to encourage them and to uh, make them look at um, a, a different perspective of life. Um, in terms of uh, protecting their own environment and taking ownership of what um, their roles are in the community, uh, in their household, in their family, so that they can, uh, yeah, we can all achieve what we, we've um, been trying so hard to, uh, in terms of water, in terms of reducing all the impacts of climate change and in, in terms of all the other issues that will come up later later in the country. But I think that uh, for me personally, my personal point of view is that if we change um, individually, we can change a nation. So um, this is why we do more awareness in the communities. We teach them, we educate them, and we encourage them not to depend on the government or to someone. I, not to uh, just sit there and ask for aid or things like that, but to, to do something in their own community. So, uh, but the current situation and the current context of Vanuatu is that the government is working closely with all of the stakeholders at the NGOs, the INGOs and um, the provincial government until it reaches down to the grassroots level. So. Um, this is how it works here in, in Vanuatu. But I think that most of what we, uh, Vanuatu Climate Action Network, are doing is to help the youth turn away the perspective and not going into uh, drugs or things like that, alcohol, but to, yeah, to do something good and protect the environment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I love that and how we should all work with, mobilize our youth definitely are uh, the bearer of how we will use our resources, our land, and definitely our waters. Nia uh, Jiten, your final thoughts on this. What, we can, do, what can we do? I, I know you have shared already a lot, uh, mm -hmm. but on these questions, uh, how do we fill this gap? How do we work? How do we work? And to make them commit and act. Yeah, but I think... Uh, sorry. Uh... Hi, Leah. You can go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Leah, yeah, Leah. You go, you go first, Leah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. All right. Okay. So, but, so I think um, every time we speak in these events, um, we always say that even though we are brought together by problems and issues, we should always end with hope um, because uh, we know that we are up against like big players here, corporations, government. But then again, they are just 1% of the population. We are uh, more. <laughs> we are more than them. And uh, I think it's important to see that we have power to change uh, our situation. It's, it's true that our rights, uh, despite them being inherent to us as human beings, we should claim them. And um, we cannot do this if we do not work together. So I think, um, yeah, it's always cliche to say that, you know, unity is the key, but it's still the best answer. And I think that it's important also to get organized. Um, it's important that we work together in a systematic programmatic action um, because this is the only way that our initiatives can be amplified. So um, there are mechanisms in place like to put um, corporations be held in account for our governments to take action. But these 
mechanisms will only work if we take that initiative and if, if we take that together. Maybe that's just um, um, our thoughts and I hope that everybody can also um, continue that hope and you know, not to really be feel, not to feel really defeated by all these problems. Thank you so much, Tia. And finally, Jite. Yeah, I, I think we should challenge the notion uh, that uh, then how the state and also the corporate project uh, indigenous and not just indigenous but also other communities as uh, as uh, anti development no? because often uh, this kind of unsustainable uh, and destructive last time or even mining projects are being pursued in the pretext of development. No? Um, and, uh, and 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 the, and the projection is that people are indigenous or other people are um, object obstructing the development. I think this is a wrong notion, and I think we should continue to forward that um, indigenous peoples and any other rural communities are actually protecting and taking care of the land. And in fact, people are taking care of the land of a river, of a forest. No, and I think this has to be recognized by uh, the government and you know all those who are trying to destroy the earth. Um, and this is very fundamental, and we should also challenge uh, the the and with that notion, there is this uh, denying of our democratic space, no? Because they don't want to listen to our alternatives, and people are suggesting uh, good alternatives, and also people are practicing alternatives, sustainable alternatives, no? Through our own way of life, through um, uh, you know, uh, through low consumption of uh, energy, for example or even um, uh, taking care of the land. And there are so many good uh, solutions offered. No? And I think those alternatives need to be um, uh, promoted uh, by the, you know, by the government and all, all those concerns. No? And I think that is extremely important. Uh, and and from, from the indigenous peoples, I think we should uh, continue to assert our right over our land resources. And there are so many good, uh, good examples, success stories, no? success stories of how indigenous peoples and other are able to defend our river or land or forest. And from those success stories, uh, there are so many success stories in Manipur here, in Sikkim. And I think uh, there are also success stories in, in the Philippines as well no? and many other places. So we can learn from all the success stories and to, to reach to those success stories, it involves a lot of common effort, collective effort of the communities. And I think that's uh, a lot of the solution um, uh, is 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 embedded in those kind of uh, success, no? And ultimately, what matters is the collective struggle, the collective effort, uh, and involvement of all concern is extremely important. Yeah. And with that, uh, for us, let's continue to take care of our land. Let's continue to ensure that our rivers flow free for all generations. Let's uh, ensure that we are able to uh, strengthen our unity and solidarity to defend and protect our land, uh, not just for, uh, for uh, present generation, but also for all the coming generations. Thank you so much, thank you. and thank you so much, Leah, to our speakers, and to our, on our last part of our program, and to wrap all these things up, to really, to, to uplift us more. <laughs> We're in a, in a better mood uh, as we end here, although we have discussed a lot of challenges and a lot of issues and concerns that face us. Uh, let's all welcome Caroline, uh, all the way from Nairobi, from Ibon International Africa, to close our program and take us, thank us all, and look forward to what we can do together. Caroline? Thank you, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, my name is Carolina Muturi, the Africa Coordinator of Ibon International, headquartered in Manira, Philippines. We also have Africa Regional Hub based in Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you for this opportunity to share on our work in climate, development, aggression, and corporate capture, and also to close the program on this webinar that's titled Committing to the Flow of Water of People-Centered Water Action at the United Nations Water Conference 2023. This conversation is timely, especially in this part of the world, considering the ravaging drought, the worst in 40 years, and the floods that were experienced three days ago in Kenya. Today, we heard from our incredible speakers on how a truly people-centered water action should look like, and the policy recommendations, as well as the ways forward. 
One thing for sure is that we, the civil society organizations and the people's movements must relentlessly continue to pressure our governments and multinationals to stop viewing rivers as sources of profit. Rivers are a source of life, culture and livelihood. The intrinsic relationship with rivers, forest and land must be recognized and respected. Thank you to our speakers for also highlighting these notorious multinationals that are prioritizing profits over people's rights. We must continue to pressure these private entities to stop their destructive projects that have massive environmental impacts to both people and environment. And just to affirm, we are together in demanding and defending the rights of environmental defenders, defending our rivers and waters. Well, climate change is exacerbating both water scarcity and water-related hazards, such as floods and droughts. As rising temperatures disrupt precipitation patterns and the entire water cycle, water and climate change are inextricably linked. Climate change affects the world's water in complex ways, from unprecedented rainfall patterns to shrinking ice sheets, rising sea levels, floods, and droughts. Water scarcity is one issue that has been on the rise, especially among the urban poor in most African countries. For instance, in Nairobi, water supply is unable to meet the fast growing demand due to rural urban migration. Water is unreliable even to the small minority who have direct connection to tapped water. For those who cannot get enough reliance to enough water, reliance on alternative and regulated service suppliers is a necessity. But these practices cost much higher than the legal rate. There is a need to create awareness that water is integral for sanitation and hygiene. Where water is scarce, sanitation is compromised and hygiene is poor. In the Africa region, liberalization and deregulation policies imposed by the World Trade Organization and other trade and investment agreements facilitated the expansion of monocrop plantation, chemical-based agriculture, privatization of public services and hazardous production processes. These practices promoted and advanced by big private corporations for the aging that drives by diversity loss, natural and man-made disasters and resource grabbing from communities as well as farmers and indigenous peoples, among others. Thus, trade policies and practices directly impact and, in fact, worsen the climate crisis. The climate crisis, in turn, exacerbates poverty, inequality, and conflict within the region. Corporate entities fuel climate crisis while taking away our resources, such as water. Privatization of water has affected millions of Africans, especially the urban poor, indigenous communities, peasants, farmers, and rural women. This is because commercialization of water causes an increase of water rates and therefore affordability of water is on the basis of affordability. Water scarcity in the region has resulted in local, national, regional, and intercontinental conflicts. At the local level, communities have been fighting due to shrinking water points. On the regional level, there has been conflicts between countries on the Nile Treaty, which has been said to be unfair to upstream countries. For instance, Kenya imports electricity from Uganda, which generates electricity from the Nile, and this Nile is actually fed by rivers from Kenya. For even Africa, climate resilience also requires involving people and communities who are defending their lives and livelihoods in shaping and owning development policies as well as the programs. This means supporting and encouraging civil society organizations and people's movements in demanding for inclusion and democratic participation in relevant government processes related to climate action. Development must be democratic in nature, in that it has a human rights-based approach. Peoples should have the power to make their choices and claim their rights, both individually and collectively. For development to be equitable and to benefit the whole of society, it, it must go beyond merely producing more goods and increasing incomes. Economic growth must 
through equitable redistribution lead to eradication of multidimensional poverty and inequality. At the same time, development must be sustainable to be truly beneficial in the long run. For us, committing to the flow of people-centered water action means com committing to address the systemic barriers to the people's rights to their own resources. From livers to wetlands, it means holding accountable those who take away this right. It means listening to the demands of communities from Africa to Asia, to the Pacific, to the Latin America, who are already fighting for sufficient water and accessible, safe, sufficient and accessible water. Let us continue developing our solidarity in this common struggle as our lives and rights are at stake. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolina, for that wonderful message. And before we end this, I would just like to thank our wonderful interpreter, Curry Rodriguez. Let's put our hands together for Curry. Thank you so much for doing a big help for us. And of course, thank you to all our speakers, to our participants. This is not the end. This is just the start of this unity, solidarity, and action that we are building. We'll start with the waters. We'll go on our lands. We push together to achieve people-centered water solutions, people-centered water action for our climate, for people-centered development. And we can do this alone. We should do it together. So again, thank you so much. Let's keep uh, connected. Follow us on our social medias. Email us so we can uh, continue our work with you. Thank you so much and we hope to see you again.